Hi everybody, I'm Terry Wright, a founder of uh, hotspotting.com.au. Welcome to today's special event. And today we're discussing a topic that I think more and more investors are going to be interested in as uh, property markets change, especially in the bigger cities. And our topic is, don't wait for the market, create your own capital growth. And this addresses the potential for investors to undertake small developments. Increasingly, I find property investors are not content with the old paradigm of what's known as passive investment, where you buy an existing property, install a tenant, and wait for it to grow in value. More and more, investors are looking for strategies to accelerate the growth process. And undertaking small-scale developments is potentially one of the most exciting and dynamic ways to do it. I imagine that some real estate consumers at least think that undertaking developments is perhaps too big or too complex for them to contemplate, but I think today's webinar will show us that that's not the case. Our special guest today to tell us about the possibilities is Alex Dudd from one of our partner businesses, Advisable. And just before I introduce Alex and uh, his presentation, I just want to remind you that um, those of you out there watching and listening, if you have any questions, please type them into the either the chat box or the Q&A box, and those will come up on my screen. And towards the end of the presentation, uh, I'll put your uh, questions to Alex, and so hopefully you'll get uh, plenty of answers to your most pressing questions. So, Alex, welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks very much for uh, giving up your lunch breaks and uh, just to listen to little old me. Um, today, I'll be talking, as Terry mentioned, about creating wealth through small scale development. Um, a little bit of a background about us. So uh, we are advisable, so we're independent buyers agents and property investment advisors based in Sydney. You might have heard uh, my associate Kate Hill talk about um, some of the areas that we've been buying in, some of the areas to watch um, in, a, in a webinar about a month ago. So um, be sure to catch that one if you missed that one. Um, we operate under a fee-for-service business model, so we do not sell real estate. So again, we're independent buyers agents and advisors. Within the past two years alone, we've purchased over 125 properties with a value of over $50 million. Um, and our main focus during this time has been buying and developing properties in Queensland, South Australia, uh, and New South Wales on behalf of our clients. And we're members of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, uh, REBA, so the Real Estate Buyers Agents Association of Australia, the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, and most importantly, all of our advisors are qualified property investment advisors and fully licensed agents as well. Uh, I've got a few disclaimers to go through. The first disclaimer is the ubiquitous um, financial advice disclaimer, which means that, you know, this, please note that this information contained within is, is general in nature and does not constitute personal financial advice. So to determine whether these strategies and concepts are suitable for your unique circumstances, we urge you to consult with your appointed financial professional. So the second disclaimer that I have is that property development is a huge topic, okay? So that, that um, chap there putting, uh, trying to get his couch into his little hatchback was how I felt trying to get this, uh, all the information that I had up here, stored up here that I wanted to pass on uh, into a, you know, an, a one hour presentation. So it was a big job. So hopefully I've at least, um, you know, I'm able to, to give you guys some, some information whether you're at whatever experience level you're at uh, in terms of investment or, or even property development. So I've mixed it up in terms of, um, I guess, some high level stuff and also some nuts and bolts, um, practical information and also some examples. So there's quite a bit we're going to go through. Um, the, sec the third disclaimer, I should say, is that um, I, wanted, I was very um, mindful of the examples that I provided because, I mean, we run a very transparent and ethical business at Advisable and it was important to us that we, we showed you examples that were actually readily achievable. Uh, we didn't want to paint a picture of um, examples that were, you know, one in a million. Obviously, we work very hard to find the examples and they are unique. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're easy to come up, easy to find the examples, but at the same time, we did want to show examples um, that were achievable and realistic out there in the marketplace. So they're my three disclaimers. Um, in terms of what we're going to cover off today, uh, I'm going to do a bit of a, an overview of the type of property development that we're going to be discussing. Then I'm going to look at why, why people um, get involved, why property investors get involved in property development, so some of the benefits. 
um, how. So we're going to look at some real life examples, including the due diligence process that we go through as buyers agents uh, when we're looking at uh, development opportunities. Um, and also some of the traps, obviously some of the pitfalls to look at based on, um, you know, what I've seen over the, over the years. Um, and I've been, just as a bit of background, I've been investing in property since the early 2000s myself and been in the industry for over 10 years. Um, and some of the tips that I've seen along the way, and we'll look at, I guess, uh, also some, some locations that of interest. Um, I'm going to look, it's going to be pretty high level in terms of locations because, as I mentioned earlier, Kate, my associate, covered off on that in, in quite great detail. That was the nature of her entire presentation. So right now, I want to focus more on property development, some of the practical skills that we can apply to the various areas. Uh, and then we'll have a QA. and uh, As Terry mentioned, if you've got any questions, feel free to you know, type them away and send them in through to Terry. Um, my calling card always seems to be running out of time when I do presentations, so I'll, I'll definitely try and be disciplined this time around. So when we talk about property development, I guess I just wanted to cover off on exactly what we're talking about because it has many different, I guess, um, it can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, and what I'm talking about is not buying off the plan or house land packages from a third party developer. For me, it's about helping investors become the developer in their own right. Okay, so I'm not saying necessarily the, they're necessarily not the way to go. You can't make money out of buying off the plan or house and land, but that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, and we're not talking about investing in developments via shared ownership structure, such as syndicate, partnership, trust, or investment fund. Again, I'm not saying these are these systems or these these ways don't work. I'm just saying that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about a development whereby one investor becomes a sole owner, okay, and they're buying something with up um, an upswing potential, so equity potential to to manufacture some growth, as as Terry mentioned earlier. Uh, and we're talking about a development that enables the investor to have contr total control over the property through development process and they're reaping 100% of the benefit. So in other words, they're owning the site, they're buying the untapped site and they're getting all of the benefit. And most importantly right now with lending where it is, with APRA and the Royal Commission and what banks are doing, uh, it's ever so important that we look at options that are you know, able to be financed for me models. Okay? So I'm looking at development opportunities that are, that are being able, able to be funded through standard residential lending. Okay? And you don't have to be an experienced developer to access it. So I'm not talking about um, opportunities that require commercial lending or to have a track record. Uh, in terms of being able to obtain finance. So that's, that's very important. So I guess that's, in a nutshell, what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, why property development? Um, obviously, you know, the, the most uh, obvious answer or direct answer is for sh to manufacture short-term profit. So you want to create equity. So whether that's profit that you realise in the short term or, or equity that you create on paper that you're able to use uh, to leverage into other properties or so on, but that's the idea. You're manufacturing uh, some equity. You're not being reliant on the market. And in turn, that means that you've got greater control over the investment performance. And right now with uh, markets being a little bit all over the place, some are going sideways, um, you know, this is a way to... I guess circumvent that and be less reliant on what the market's doing and capitalise on some of the opportunities that, you know, that are there to, to the astute buyer. And also manufacture rent. So manufacture yield. Uh, I'm not necessarily advocating um, property to buy property as a cash flow uh, tool, but it's, it's obviously cash flow or rent return makes a property more affordable. So that can help with holding. So uh, property development is... Um, you know, it enables you to create manufacture yield uh, and again can make the property much more affordable to hold. And also buying uh, and building new, there's some financial incentives in there such as stamp duty savings. So with the development, with any purchase, you pay stamp duty on the, uh, the initial purchase, so the site purchase or the block of land. Uh, you don't pay stamp duty on a construction contract. Okay, so there's a bit of saving there. And also building and buying, building new, I should say, um, you've got greater depreciation deductions. And this was very important um, based on the, the, the budget changes as of last year um, relating to, you know, how, how depreciation deductions are claimed. So obviously if you're building from scratch yourself, you're getting full depreciation deductions uh, on both sides of, in terms of fixtures and fittings and the building write-off uh, compa compared to established. So there's some benefits there 
uh, from a financial aspect. And also we've got, I guess, benefits of new property in itself. Uh, tends to be you know, more appealing from a, a resale and a tenancy point of view. Uh, people like newer. Um, lower maintenance, if you're built right, uh, you've got lower maintenance. And you're also covered by warranty with your, your various appliances and things like that and materials. And also you've got a builder's structural warranty protection as well. And you're able to customise. So you can basically build exactly what's going to appeal to the local resale uh, and, and tenant market as well. So to me, that's really, really important. When we're looking as buyers, agents and established properties, we're also, you know, one of the most important things that we are, ascertain in any given area what is the what do the local renters and and buyers want uh, most probably more more likely what the buyers want because that's resale is what's going to make us money from a capital growth standpoint from a profit standpoint but again if we're building from scratch by development we can really hone in and and really hit the mark with exactly what what people want in the in any given area and I look I, at the end of the day it's I guess it's a more challenging and potentially more rewarding option for the evolving investor so as I mentioned I've been working with investors for over 10 years and there are some recurring themes that I see I've seen along the way and one of those recurring themes is that at some point a property investor will get to the point where they want to experiment with property invest uh, sorry property development so whether that's you know after their first purchase whether it's after their 10th purchase inevitably uh, my experience is that property investors will want to dip their toe into some kind of development it's not for everyone there are risks involved uh, and it can be quite expensive uh, and quite a uh, an involved process um, but it can also be a very rewarding uh, process as well so that's the why um, so one of the strategies that I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about a couple of different strategies but um, one of the strategies that I'm going to talk a lot about in the early stages here is that subdivide and hold so um, quite often people think about developing to with the intention to sell uh, and that definitely works um, but it makes the process that much harder okay because you've got a lot of considerations which I'll, I'll touch on as the presentation uh, we go through it um, but this subdividing with the intention of holding um, really turns the process on its head and it creates an opportunity for us to, to really capitalize on many more opportunities so what I mean by Firstly, what I mean by subdivide is we're finding a site that we can essentially turn into multiple sites. So we're basically subdividing a block of land and turning it into multiple um, independently titled uh, lots. Now, typically with standard residential lending, we're going to be limited to a maximum of three separate lots. So splitting one block into three. Uh, some lenders, are max, it's a maximum of two. So we're looking at, when we talk about these subdivisions, we're looking at uh, for again, if we're stand, staying under that standard residential lending umbrella, we're looking at a maximum of three or perhaps two, depending on your lender. Now, in terms of holding, what I'm saying there is we hold beyond the completed com completion of the development. So we're looking at uh, splitting a block, uh, and I'll go through all this in more detail, but splitting a block and basically hanging on to it and renting it out for a while. So whether that's because they're independently titled, we can do it with one of them, we can sell them separately. Um, or you know we can hold them for a few years before we sell we can hold them both for the long term um, but again by subdividing and holding it really turns the whole process on its head and enables us to look at opportunities um, that you know I guess people that were looking to make an instant profit and sell straight away uh, then are not going to work for them. one of the things that I've learned along the way and I've seen all of the best cases with making money through small scale development. And it is more difficult, obviously it's a scalable thing, the more money you've got to spend on development in terms of access to commercial lending and the greater scale you can develop, the, the more readily uh, profit is, is achieved, uh, the greater the risk of course, but when we're looking at small scale, it can be quite difficult to make it work. Um, so it might look good in theory and on paper, but it's quite difficult to actually make it, make it profitable with all the considerations. So, but of all the best examples I've seen of this, um, there's always a combination of, of one of three things. It's either someone's bought the existing site uh, when the market was, you know, in a, in a bull run or they bought very, very well and they've seen significant capital growth on the site, along, whether that's along the way while they've been redeveloping or they bought some time ago and it's been exposed to considerable capital growth. Or the second and third option kind of similar is that um, 
they're either owner builders uh, or they they work with builders and they're able to get very good uh, rates in terms of construction. And those three things tend to really make a I guess the best case scenario. And that's obviously we we do have some control about when we're buying the site, but for most of us we're not builders. Uh, we've got other professions uh, or, or other interests that we want to do. Uh, so I guess it can be difficult to tap into or leverage off being, you know, I guess um, the benefits of knowing builders or being builders ourselves. So that's why they kind of work around that uh, to soften that we can look at holding on to it for a little while. And we also alleviate some other considerations, which I'll touch on uh, throughout the presentation relating to selling straight away. So here's an example uh, in, uh, in Brisbane. So this is a subdivision example. This is uh, in, a, in a suburb in, in the Sandgate region, which is about 18 kilometres uh, north, uh, next to the coast there uh, in Brisbane. It's under Brisbane City Council. Uh, this particular lot, uh, over 800 square metres, so that's, the, um, that's what we're looking for in, in, in Brisbane City Council. We want to split a block. Uh, a split block, a subdividable block that we can turn into two, into two 400 plus square metre lots. Uh, and the configuration that we're after is we want a 20 uh, metre frontage and a 40 metre deep block. And we're going to turn that into two lots, 10 metres wide and, and 40 metres deep. So 400 square metres. So this block, you can see it's double fronted. The house is nothing flash, um, but you know, that's the whole point. We're looking at the raw land. Uh, and in effect, the house was nothing flash because we wanted to get rid of it. Um, so that's the demolition process. And ultimately what we did with that lot was turn it into two owner-occupier homes. Owner. So we're going to rent these out. Uh, we are holding them and renting them out, but they're appealing to the local resale market. So that's most important. So the rule of thumb with any development, small-scale development, is uh, we want to maximise the, the land that we've got by squeezing the biggest dwelling we can get away with on the site, okay? And that's, in this case, the biggest dwelling or the biggest uh, structure that the market would bear is two five-bed, uh, three-bath, four-living, double lock-up garage homes, okay? So big homes, much bigger than my home, but, uh, you know, that's, again, that's what the local market uh, would bear there, and that's, I guess, the maximum use of the site. So you can see on the floor plans, they are big homes, uh, around 265 square metres. Uh, so two high set, two stories, and you can see the living areas there. So that's that was the I guess the best uh, use of that particular site. So we've turned um, a little old weatherboard house sitting right in the middle of a big block into two uh, big big homes there. So as an example of one that I purchased recently, I thought I'd go through the numbers, and this particular one was in Wavell Heights, which is about um, 11 kilometres north of Brisbane CBD. So it's a really great spot. Um, gone through some significant changes over the last five years. Um, it's very much quite an active market in Brisbane terms compared to you know, a lot of investors that I talk to that are buying on the fringes of Brisbane. They can attest that the markets aren't always that active out there, but in the inner, inner rings or middle rings, some of these owner occupier markets are very, very strong. Uh, and this is definitely falls into that category. So again, we've got a big block there. So um, big block, 814 square metres, had a pretty uh, average house when uh, our builder went and inspected the house for some preliminary due diligence. I can't repeat what, how he described the house because the harsh language, but uh, he didn't paint a pretty picture, put it that way. But again, we're looking at it as a raw site and what the block of land uh, can offer. Uh, so the house itself is immaterial. It is important that we do our due diligence on the house in relation to demolition, which I'll touch on in a bit. Um, but basically, when we're doing our preliminary assessment, we're looking at what is this block of land worth? What can we do with it? And so on. So again, weatherboard tile roof home, pretty modest. Um, 1950s build. Uh, falls under Brisbane City Council. Uh, last sold um, about 10 months after I was born, so for 18900 So it's, it's a, definitely a testament to um, the, I guess, how rare these sites come up uh, in Wavell Heights. Again, uh, going back to my disclaimer about being a unicorn, they do exist. Um, I'm not going to say this one was easy to find. It was purchased off market. So it was uh, a lot of work to find it and get access to it and be able to buy it. So I never saw the light of day on realestate.com or anything like that. Um, but they are out there. There's a handful of them left, um, split of blocks, and they're not on the market, but they're definitely out there in these, in these suburbs. Um, but again, 
great spot in terms of being able to develop and build a big home to appeal to the owner occupier market. So we paid 810 for this and we looked at it purely as, okay, what's each block worth? In Wayful Heights, if we can get 400 plus square meter blocks, what are they worth? Okay, so I'll take you through the numbers on this particular one. So purchase price for 810, as I mentioned, purchase costs, so our stamp duty and our legal fees are around $34,000. Our subdivision costs, and I'll do a breakdown in my next example uh, what all those subdivision costs are, but council contributions, all those bits and pieces that we're going to need to pay, worked out to be to split the block $88,000 and construction for two very big homes, three thirty. dollars Okay, so two, again, we're going to follow that model of a five bed, uh, four living, three bathroom, double lock up garage home. For this one, uh, we won't be putting in in-ground pools, but just as a side note, uh, what we'll do with this one is we'll put a um, we'll put a gate between the two fences between the property. So when we come to sell, um, we'll we'll have be able to access through the backyards, so trades can get in there and put in in-ground pools if we choose to, uh, to be more appealing to the local resale market. So that's the demographic that we're really going for. So we obviously we want to make sure we can we can tenant these properties, and they can they'll definitely rent. Um, but the end goal is to build something that's going to appeal to the local owner occupier market, and that includes putting in a pool. Uh, we don't want to worry about pools while we're renting them out for the next whatever long it takes, whether it's five or ten years. Um, but it, we make kind of allowances along the way to, to maximise resale potential. So the project cost all up is going to be around 1.55 million, and the end value, which I've conservatively put in at 885 per side, and I'll talk you through how I came up with that valuation shortly. Uh, so that's quite conservative. So I've got a gross profit in there of 211000 so on paper, which is around 14%. Okay, so again, this is why once we start looking at developing to sell, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, other costs eating into that, selling agents' costs, capital gains tax, GST, and things like that, which I'll explain later. Um, but that'll lead into that. But on paper, we're creating some genuine equity in there. So the other way to look at it as well is outside of just creating equity on the end result in terms of what we're putting in, the 155 against the 177. We could, the other way to look at it is what we're actually putting in up front. So if we're borrowing 80% against our site purchase price of 810 and our construction cost of 660, so in other words, we're getting loans against those two things we can borrow. We're using existing equity or cash against for, to pay for our purchase cost, our subdivision costs, our 20% deposits on, on the purchase price of the site and 20% for the construction and then other contingency along the way, excuse me, such as um, our loan interest repayments and things like that throughout the, pro the process. If we look at that lump sum money, so we're putting in $416,000 as our deposit we're actually getting a 51% return on investment within 12 months. So this project, based on uh, knock on wood with the DA, uh, you know, we'll be able to get that done pre-settlement uh, and we'll get to site pretty quickly. So we should have this all turned around again, knock on wood, within 12 months. Uh, so the return on investment, if you look at it that way, it's about 51% on, on the capital up front. Not, not including selling, of course, as I mentioned, but that's, uh, you know, if you look at it that way, it's quite a good return. So the rent on these ones is about conservatively appraised at 725 per side, so while we're holding them. I actually saw some comparables renting for a close to 800, so I've scaled that right back to be quite conservative. So 725 a side, which is a yield of about 4.8%. Typically, when we're looking at Brisbane, we can expect about a, a 5 to 5.2% yield. Um, once we start looking at the more executive rentals, uh, which this would fall in the category of, uh, we might see some slight scaling back in terms of that yield amount. But first year depreciation, we're getting quite a lot of depreciation. Again, quite a conservative calculation there, but we're looking at about uh, 14,000 give or take per side. Uh, so that's first year, so that's full depreciation. So obviously that helps out with the cash flow. So this particular development, once all said and done, will actually be positive cash flow. Uh, and this particular number was based on our investor borrowing everything. So using existing equity, existing loan funds, in their existing portfolio, borrowing against the, as I mentioned, the site purchase price of construction contracts. So effectively gearing everything. So they're not putting any any cash at all. Um, and I've looked at an interest only loan loan repayment type, four and a half percent interest rate and a 37% marginal rate of tax. So if you're paying, if you're getting a better interest rate and uh, you're on a higher marginal rate of tax, obviously the holding cost would be would be higher. So 
effectively you're able to leverage into an investment that's I understand it's a considerable amount of money, 1.5, and I'll kind of cover off on some other examples a little bit more uh, ch uh, cheaper. Um, but effectively, you're able to create some on paper profit of over $200,000, and it hasn't cost you anything in terms of cash flow. Uh, so it's not a not a bad not a bad result. Uh, and most importantly, you're you're smack bang in a really good growth area. So. Um, that's obviously the fundamental reason why we're doing this. Uh, just as a comparison in terms of purchase costs, just how it would reflect um, uh, against a, an established property purchase. Um, and we're not saying one's better than the other. We obviously as buyers agents do predominantly established property purchases. Um, so the, if we spend the same amount of money on an established property or a number of them within Brisbane uh, or Queensland, I should say, uh, stamp duty is actually 75000 So again, you're going to have holding costs throughout construction, so it's not necessarily a black and white uh, cut and dry comparison, but it does give you an idea of, okay, what is the stamp duty saving? So just a bit of perspective there. You can see what we're saving if we're to buy established versus buy something and redevelop. So that's, I guess, the numbers. So in terms of the due diligence that we do um, as, as buyers agents, uh, most importantly, and I touched on this earlier, uh, the site needs to tick all of the usual property, location, and growth driver boxes, okay? So although development can create some pretty good um, growth for us or on paper equity gains for us, as, as per the previous slide, in my mind, it's not a replacement, it's to supercharge what you're already doing. So. Very much, you know, I remember talking to a couple of investors over the years and they've said to me, and I talked about various um, returns on development. I said, look, it's readily achievable. We can look at something in the early teens uh, within 12 months. And they've said, you know, particularly in the last kind of three or four years, I heard it a lot with investors that have said to me, well, I got that myself just buying an established property in Sydney or, or Melbourne and I've seen that growth. Um, and my answer to that is always yes, but we want that as well. So we want, we want, we want our cake and eat it too. We want that. Um, profit via the uh, development, um, but we're also buying in an area that still, you know, definitely ticks all those boxes from a capital growth standpoint. And I can't stress that enough. So we very much still need to do all our usual due diligence in terms of area, uh, in terms of location. So in some cases with these two examples, the previous two examples that we looked at, obviously we're demolishing, so we're starting from scratch. So we're assessing where the location of a a dirt patch is, but it's still very important that we're looking at proximity to amenities and so on. So we still need to make sure that we're, we've got all our, uh, our boxes ticked there. The other thing is that we need to look at, uh, for assessing a development site, we need to look at a confirmation of the lot size and boundaries. And quite often you might think that's a bit of a no brainer because you jump on a price finder or something that tells you how big it is. Um, quite often in my experience, these um, tools are wrong. The Wavell Heights one, for example, um, gave us some erroneous information through price finder and I had to do a title search to actually confirm how big it was and this is important because it was going to be make or break as to whether we could subdivide and develop and it was such a the the, the title was um, so old that it was actually in the archaic measurement of um, of links and purchase so we had to um, do the conversion there into square meters um, but there was three sources that were all providing conflicting information and again the whole project swung on whether you know how big it was in terms of boundaries and, and size per square meter so that's really important um, we also obviously in some of this look that some of its preliminary due diligence we're going to do up front before we even start putting in offers and things like that uh, and other due diligence is going to come out during the wash whether we're doing it during our due diligence um, condition so if we've purchased subject to a due diligence clause and we're doing our due diligence work there and we're using um, a combination of professionals and our solicitor um, but some of the things we need to look at any title restrictions whether there's any covenants or heritage overlays on the site but also if there's any easements and we do obviously a lot of this as buyers agents on established properties anyway so it's not all development specific um, but it's, you know, it's important due diligence nonetheless. And this, I guess the next part is, it's a little bit of an interesting one. If you're doing this as a private developer, um, it can be a little bit harder because as a buyer's agent, we've obviously got uh, a lot of re re relationships with professionals that we've work, we worked with over the years. 
So we're able to ask them to do, I guess, love jobs. So they do things for us in terms of for free uh, with the you know assumption that they'll get the work down the track. Um, but, and it's a bit of chicken and egg. So when we're looking at sites, obviously we want to talk to some of these professionals and get them to um, give us feedback for free on the sites and tell us whether it's going to stack up and kind of, you know, I guess cheekily try and get, get information as I mentioned. And that's, it can be a little bit harder um, to get that from, from the general public and know who to work with, um, you know, and try and get that information if you don't have those relationships. But it's still, you're going to need these professionals at some point. So a town planner can help you, give you advice on what the cost is and of, of subdividing. So your, count, your costs with council to um, put the DA through, so your development application, um, and give you advice as well, a bit of feedback on, on the site. Uh, itself and you know the development potential you're also going to need a civil engineer now a town plan is going to engage a civil engineer on your behalf but it's also good I think when you're doing a preliminary due diligence and number crunching to talk to a civil engineer who can give you advice on water storm water and sewer infrastructure so they've got access to some uh, subscription sites such as dial before you dig and things like that but you can also access uh, as a as a private uh, individual but um, you know again this is really important information that you want to you want to glean from you know as part of your due diligence on the site itself and again a builder so you're not necessarily engaging a builder straight away but it can be very helpful if you can get a builder to look at your site and give you advice on anything that might be hairy or curly about the site that you need to keep in mind so whether it's the slope of the block and what would retaining an earthworks cost um, some of these also overlap so with a civil engineer, um, they can give you advice and draw up a, a scope of works for, you know, water and sewer and stormwater infrastructure. But in some cases, such as, you know, stormwater, a builder might actually integrate that into the construction uh, price there, which would be a little bit more cost effective. So things like that, working with those, um, with those professionals. The other one is uh, getting a demolition expert to give you some advice as well. So obviously that's quite important if our intention is to, uh, demolish a site and clear the site uh, and on that note I mean quite often uh, if you look at the example we looked at in Wavell Heights we had a couple of um, pretty minor trees on there they weren't that, that big a few meters high um, but they'll be demolished as part of the, uh, the demo work so we don't need a tree lopper um, but if you've got trees that are on the fence line and things like that you might also need a tree lopper because uh, you know your demo demo guys will go in there with a bulldozer, and if they start taking out trees, they could take out half the fence and next door uh, if there's trees on the on the line there. Um, but on that note of trees, you also want to do a vegetation check with council just to see whether there's any protected trees on site. So quite often, I mean Brisbane City Council is great for this. You can ring them up, you can get a, they'll give you a, a, um, a reference number. You take down the name of the individual you spoke to, and you've got basically a record of you know whether or not confirmation whether there's any um, protected trees on site that's not bulletproof mind you but it can at least at this stage before you've lodged your deal you know that there's nothing no no trees that are going to make or break the deal at this stage and then you do your usual flood and bushfire mapping as well and again we do this as standard ba um, purchases for anything anyway but it's obviously just important preliminary due diligence and a rental appraisal from a property manager. So if we're looking at developing to hold, um, we want we want to know what the property is obviously going to rent for. You saw before I used an example there that we had a rental appraisal done at 725. Uh, now we we'll scale back a little bit, but we look at conservative estimates there. But that's obviously going to give us an insight into what the property is going to rent for. The completed development, I should say, is going to rent for. Uh, and it's also at that point can be really useful to talk to property managers, local property managers, about what they're seeing with the rental market. So what are some of the things that we need to keep in mind if we're building? And again, I really do stress the point that we're building from a resale perspective to appeal to own occupiers. We're not necessarily building from a, a rental standpoint. But in saying that, if our plan is to rent these out for the medium to long term, um, you know, it's going to be pretty miserable to hold these properties if we can't find tenants and we can't get the maximum rent. So um, we really do want to, I guess, make sure we've got both bases covered in terms of appealing to tenants, but most importantly, appealing to the resale market. And on that note, we need to do a valuation. Obviously, to me, as a buyer's agent, uh, again, whether it's a development or established property, I think I always say this is you know, probably the number one skill to have. Uh, and, and that goes through to any real estate professional. And I can't stress that enough. I mean, 
to, to remove the mystery and be able to put your finger on an amount, actually quantify what a property is worth. Uh, to me, that's absolutely critical. And it's probably also, I mean, the number one skill, if you're a, an, an investor out there just doing it for yourself, uh, to me, that's the, you know, the number one skill to hone, to spend a lot of time. Uh, and it's also obviously the, the number one thing that people get wrong. Uh, but again, we want resale, uh, we want evaluation on, on the initial site purchase to make sure we're paying a good price, but also uh, what, you know, how does it stack up and what's it going to make for us at the end. So the resale on completion, uh, and at that point we can also talk to some, some uh, local agents as well and get some feedback, feedback there. So, and most, you know, as I mentioned before, we went through the numbers, a feasibility study. So we've got to make sure that there's some profit in the whole development. Okay. So, you know, just, um, you know, one of my friends, he always says, just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. So, uh, you know, and this it might look good on paper, but we need to put all of these things together and make sure that there is actually going to be a market for the end, end product. Um, but most importantly, it is actually going to make us money. And once all risks and contingencies and all those ifs and buts are put in there, it's actually a profitable venture. So that's, I guess, that's not everything. Um, what we do is an, just a, a bit of insight. When we look at an established property purchase, there's about 40 odd questions that we, we go through with uh, an established dwelling. So obviously we're pulling those out because if we're doing a development where we're demolishing, um, then you know a lot of those are, are not relevant in relation to the property itself. But uh, in terms of location and all of those and relating to development, um, that's in a nutshell, that's a you know, higher level, they're the main ones. So as a bit of an insight into us doing the evaluation, which I mentioned is very, very important. This is the process we go through. And again, this is the tip of the iceberg. I didn't just do evaluation on these four, but this is, I guess, the four that I looked at, which were most comparable. So out of the 3,000 odd um, lots within Waverhill Heights, um, about 10% of those are roughly uh, big enough to be subdivided. Uh, and about 10% of those are actually uh, able to be you know, subdivided in terms of um, boundary size and, 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 yeah, in terms of just being able to uh, be subdivided and split. So there's not a huge amount to go by and there's not a huge amount that have sold. So it is doing um, valuations on sites can be very, very difficult uh, because it's not always comparable. It's not like you're doing a comparable on a four bedroom house that, you know, 50 of them have sold in the last 12 months and you can pick and choose and really drill down and find one that exactly matches. Um, because in, particularly in, in areas like Wavell Heights where the, the lots are very tightly held, um, doing comparables is, is quite difficult. So there's some compromises in there in relation to some you can see, you know, I've made some comments about location and so on, but basically I'm looking at what is the raw land worth. So the one at the top sold um, earlier in the year for just under 1.3 million, um, and that was subdividable into three lots. And that's actually a pretty slopey block, so that would cost quite a lot to um, cut and fill to get that and retain to, to get those to be ready for construction. Um, but that was kind of my benchmark um, in terms of valuation. In terms of the completed project, um, I put in there 885, which is quite conservative, which I'll show you why. But this particular one, you can see these are all blocks, all the examples here are blocks that have been split over the last 10 years. So I've got two pages there, but they're all blocks that have been split. The first one at 307, in case you're wondering how they got down to under 400, there is a provision uh, within Brisbane City Council to do blocks uh, around 600 square metres. You can cut them into blocks uh, 300 square metres in size, provided they meet certain requirements about uh, being a certain proximity to uh, major major transport hubs. Um, to me, I don't find those as appealing. Obviously, you're, you're really casting a net, net that much smaller trying to look for them in the first place. But from a resale perspective, your blocks are going to be very, very small. So own occupiers, you're not going to have much luck much uh, you know yard space left over so i'm not saying that that's a deal breaker i'm just saying my preference is to find something uh, 400 square meter plus but there are examples there of comparables what we're going to be looking at with the completed development um obviously they're in different parts to the different parts of, a, of the suburb to what we um what we bought and that's obviously going to affect the the end valuation but there you can see um you can see, I guess, I uh, get an idea of what things are selling for uh, in terms of the, you know, the local area. I would say Seven Power Street, the second from the top, that was uh, one of the comparables that I looked at as being pretty close to what we're going to build. I like to think we're going to put a nicer facade than that one. I'm not entirely convinced of that one, but uh, 
we'll probably put in five bed as well. So it'd be slightly, um, you know, larger, larger build. But again, that's a 2000 built this year um, and sold for 885 on the open market. So things are transacting. So we're not just, you know, this is really important. We're not just looking at, okay, best case scenario on paper, how does it work? We're looking at drilling right down and knowing what things are selling for. And that's really, really important. Um, so again, coming back to my comment about unicorns, they're definitely not a unicorn. We're not creating something that's a, you know, a white elephant uh, on the market. We're, we're creating something that people really want and people are, you know, lining up to buy as per the, as you can see with the, uh, the figures there. So, I'm sure um, there's people out there that are sitting there saying, that's all very well, Alex, it sounds exciting, but I don't have $1.5 million, um, you know, and I, I, that's me too, to be honest. But uh, um, so one of the, I guess, alternatives that we can look at is to buy something with the idea of developing uh, down the track or selling later. So all those, um, the due diligence that we looked at and went through uh, in relation to, to um, on the, on, the development potential on the site itself, we can apply that to something and not necessarily have to follow through with that straight away. So one of the areas that um, I really like at the moment, and I'm sure Terry, you like it as well, is Morton Bay. Um, you got any thoughts on Morton Bay, Terry? Um, you're right, Alex. Um, I do like it. I like it a lot. I think it's the, the most active part of the Brisbane metropolitan area in terms of property markets at the moment. It offers a lot in terms of affordability, uh, proximity to major jobs nodes. It's got really good infrastructure. There's new things coming up in that market, such as a new university campus, um, recent extension of rail links to the Redcliffe Peninsula, and a whole lot of other things. Um, but also find that um, when um, like mentoring clients of ours are looking for opportunities where you can do this kind of thing, where you can perhaps subdivide or perhaps um, build townhouses or whatever. It's an area that does have those sorts of opportunities. So it ticks a lot of boxes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Harry. So I couldn't agree more. And that's, I guess, why we've chosen it. So I think it's a really good option for someone that's looking at doing uh, a more affordable development, but maybe not doing following through with it straight away. And this comes off the back of one of the comments I made earlier about you know, the best stories that I've heard with development are someone that's owned the site for a long time and capitalised on the development potential uh, down the track. Um, and, and Morton Bay, they're also very progressive. So it's not Brisbane City Council. They're a separate council in, this, in their own right. And they're very progressive uh, from a development standpoint. So very, very uh, open-minded with what you can do. And this particular one, so 23 kilometres north of Brisbane CBD. Um, again, pretty... Uh, not a fantastic build on it, but again, this is what we're after, but a three bed, one bar, three carport home. But uh, most importantly on a big block, 1,026 square meter block. Purchased for 490, uh, so we're paying a lot for land size. We're not getting that 5% rental yield that we talked about, which you traditionally get uh, in Morton Bay if you're looking at a smaller land, so just a single block. Um, but again, we're paying a little bit more because of we're getting extra land. And this ties in with, you know, obviously everyone's familiar, I'm sure, with the idea that uh, you get rent return on the dwelling itself, not on the land. So the dwelling itself, uh, you know, again, is not fantastic. But again, we want to, we want to demolish, but that's the rent return as is. So, but if you look at it, um, I mean, that yield is probably comparable to what you'd pay on the outskirts of Melbourne anyway right now. Obviously, you wouldn't get the depreciation because there is no depreciation on the bill, this one in particular. Um, but the yield, it's not typical of Brisbane, but it's not, it's not that, not, not that um, unsavoury given the development potential. But, um, excuse me, most importantly, it falls under the suburban neighbourhood precinct zoning in Moreton Bay, which means you can have 15 dwellings per hectare, um, which means that this actual site is... Um, suitable for townhouse development. So there's, uh, this can fit eight townhouses on it. So these plans are specific to this. Um, but if you look through the fee, so, so we did a feasibility study on this one. Um, purchase price 490, purchase cost. So we've got our stamp duty, our legal fees, and cheekily I put in buyer's agent's fees, why not? Um, and we've got our development cost. So we've got our town planner, uh, cost for development application lodgement. We've got planned ceilings for tiling at the end. We've got our council contribution. So each time we create a second lot, uh, we have to pay uh, council for the privilege. In this case, it's around $18,000. We've got a civil works design and permit. So we've got things like 
uh, sorry, for our water and sewer infrastructure, we've got demolition, so to get rid of the, the old cow shed, that's Kate's favourite expression on the site, um, retaining an earthwork, so to get the site level. Um, the other additional con connections, survey plans, um, interest during construction, so to pay for our progress payments for our construction and for our site, if once there's no more income coming in through land, uh, through the rent, um, and also contingencies. So they're all our development costs. So you see there's quite some considerable. Um, and our construction to build the eight townhouses, 1.296. So you might be looking at this and saying, hey, you said, you know, at a cheaper alternative, but what I'm looking at here is um, something that's uh, again a little bit more affordable, but to to develop uh, and and sell sell later. So total project cost 2.3, value 2.88. So we're assuming 360,000 per unit. Gross profit uh, is 535 uh, on this one. So again, we haven't considered there. GST implications. If we're developing with the intention to sell, um, we've got GST implications uh, because we're effectively becomes a commercial venture um, and we've got capital gains tax obviously to sell within 12, 12, 12 months and we've got selling agent fees to sell these. So the profit margin for this one is 23%, which quite frankly doesn't quite stack up right now. Um, for uh, you know, for a, a developer, uh, and again, this would be really you would only be able to achieve this if you were a commercial, uh, if you had commercial uh, lending. Uh, so this would really be a professional developer turning this into um, you know making this work, um, unless you're able to form a syndicate or something like that with a, a group of your fellow investors. Um, but the profit margin is probably probably doesn't quite work just yet. Okay, so. Well, the reason I raise this is as an example of buying uh, and just knowing that it ticks all the boxes from a development standpoint with the exception of profit margin. It's still, there's money in there, um, but it's not quite uh, meaty enough to, to justify doing the development straight away. Uh, so you could look at holding on to that until such time. I mean, Terry touched on it. There's a new university going in in Petrie that's obviously going to have a dramatic effect on the, on, on the area. Um, and if you're building something like townhouses, then, you know, perhaps that's, you know, suitable for, for um, student accommodation or, or, or um, you know, locals that are going to be visiting the, the university there. So it's, to me, that's, um, you know, that's could be a lot more appealing once the market picks up uh, and can bear, I guess, the cost. So, if, you know, if you look at townhouse developments going up to be, uh, sorry, the townhouse is selling for 380 or 400, Obviously, the profit metrics are going to work much more favourably at that point, and then you can find, uh, you know, you can start to think about on selling the site. So that's an example of, I guess, two examples there to look at the market where it currently lies. Obviously, ideally, I'm not saying we can't develop with the intention of selling straight away, but given where the market is uh, right now, uh, in terms of, you know, I guess where all the markets are, I should say, not the Australia's not one big property market, but. Where, where the markets are, and I guess um, without trying to be too buoyant on certain areas, if we look at, okay, how do we hedge our bets and say, um, finding opportunities that I, I guess are gonna uh, turbocharge our, in our capital growth, we can look at opportunities, opportunities like this. So I guess some of the things to keep in mind uh, with, with developing, so I get asked a lot um, about particular areas all the time. I get asked about, uh, you know, do developments work here? Do developments work there? Um, and a lot of time it's the questions I get asked are, are, are really at the fringe areas or the cheaper areas uh, entry level. And because, you know, a lot of the development costs, construction, uh, your subdivision costs, so your council contributions uh, are mostly, um, they're not, they're fixed. They're not geographically dependent. So in other words, uh, whether you're building a house in Logan or you're building a house in Waverley Heights, it's you know in Brisbane for example, um, you know it's, it's still going to be the same cost, give or take. It might be slightly cheaper here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty much the same. So your underlying land value is that much cheaper. So the development side is going to be cheaper uh, to find. Um, but in terms of the actual um, resale, uh, that's not there either. So the market can't bear uh, you know resale. Uh, into you know metrics there so it's not going to work um, shared ownership structures I get asked this a lot me and my friends want to pull, pull funds together uh, we want to form a syndicate a trust or a partnership um, and 
I guess my comments around that is, uh, look, it can work. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I guess there's some things to consider relating to shared liability. Um, so, you know, if you're actually borrowing against the development itself, so if you're leveraging against uh, the cost of construction and the site purchase, then as a, as a co-borrower, you're going to be... Um, you're going to be liable for other people's debts as well. So that's going to significant, significantly erode, potentially significantly erode your borrowing capacity for, for things elsewhere. So you're getting effectively your 100% liable for the entire, the, um, the, the debt on the entire project, but you're only getting a portion of the, the profit. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and also shared ownership structures such as these, typically um, when you're, when you're doing a syndicate or a trust or a partnership, you don't actually own one dwelling. So if you're doing a townhouse development of, say, four townhouses and the four of you are getting together, you each own a quarter of each townhouse. So you don't own, uh, each doesn't own a single lot. So these kind of structures are really more appropriate for develop to sell strategies. And I get asked about them a lot, so that's why I thought I'd mention those. Um, and also we touched on these as well. So if you're looking to develop to sell, consider the capital gains tax and GST implications and the selling agent fees. Obviously, they're going to significantly erode your... Your, your profit margins and that's why again I looked at develop to sell and of course goes without saying but account for loan repayments during construction a lot of people kind of overlook this um, but holding a development and funding construction without any rent coming in um, although it's tax deductible uh, with your intent to rent them out uh, it still obviously makes the proposition that much more more costly from a cash flow standpoint um, so, sorry, and uh, yeah, speed of construction can be really critical there. So to make sure that you can get to site ASAP with the development and obviously engage a builder that's ready to go and can turn around developments uh, as quickly as they say they can. So some of the tips, I've got to breeze through these pretty quickly because of course I'm running out of time, as I said I would. Um, my comments about this, if you're, if you're not a professional developer, if you're just starting out, uh, I would always advocate um, developing with the intent to rese resell to and cater to the owner occupier market, not the investor market. That's really, really important. And as a general rule of thumb, I mentioned this earlier, um, but the idea is that we want them the biggest build uh, that we can possibly get away with uh, squeezing onto to the site itself. So we want to get the biggest structure we can uh, on, on that the parcel of land, uh, the lot will bear, and also the resale market as well. So that's the rule of thumb. And quite often when we're looking at, uh, again, catering to the tenant market, uh, it, it may not necessarily be, um, you know, I guess that, that two might not, 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 might not be mutually inclusive. In other words, uh, you know, it, we might be building something that doesn't necessarily suit the, ideally the uh, tenant um, demographic there. But again, we need to be appealing to the resale market um, as a, as a, um, uh, priority so as with any opportunity really um, and this is obviously what you know in part why people engage buyers agents such as myself and, and us at advisable is to find the opportunities that are not on the open market uh, but with development sites the best ones also off market it's just a fact of life I mean they don't come on, come along very often and you've got to be really ready to, to jump on them and you've got to work I, my experience is working with selling agents that actually uh, focus on securing potential development sites. And I put in the word potential there because selling agents' jobs are, are to sell. Um, they can't always, you know, obviously they, they don't know, necessarily know all the nuts and bolts relating to whether a, a site has the potential to, to be, be redeveloped. So you'll see that all the time in listings, you know, inverted commas, subject to council approval, SDCA. So you see that all the time and that's just their little disclaimer. And again, when you're looking at a site, we need to know, and it's going to be different in every area, but we need to know the ideal boundary configuration for a subdivision. So the examples that I gave, Wavell Heights one and the other one in Sandgate, we're looking at uh, 20 metre frontage, 40 metre deep. So we want to turn it into 10 by 40 blocks. Um, long and narrow that we can build two high sets on for this example. So a lot of the time, um, you know, I get asked, oh, you know, I've got a block, I bought a block ages ago just by sheer chance, it's, you know, about 100 square metres, can we subdivide? And quite often the answer is no because of a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, it could be trees on footpath, it could be, um, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, it could, could be a whole bunch of different reasons based on, uh, you know, go back to the due diligence we talked about. 
Um, and the other thing is, and on that note, you know, make sure you, when we do our due diligence, do a due diligence on the footpath and street, streetscape adjoining the block. So it could be, again, trees on, it could be the curbing, could be, um, it could be a drop off of, you know, the slopes um, away from the, um, the, the nature strip onto the front of the block. And this could affect setback. So setback is, I guess, how, how close to your boundary you can build. And this is really important because it can eat up into your developable space. So um, if this block is sloping, particularly at the front where you want a driveway, obviously that can push back um, where you can build uh, and that can leave you with a smaller yard and things like that. So it's knowing all of those really important little things along the way uh, that can really make or break a development um, throughout the process. And again, you know, like anything with property investment, uh, make sure that you assemble your team of professionals ahead of time so you can jump on any opportunity as soon as they come up. So the good ones will sell very, very fast. So, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon for me to have a, uh, you know, a site or even any property opportunity drop into my lap. Um, I say they're tongue in cheek. Obviously, there's been a lot of groundwork to get them, but that we, we get them, um, they appear, you know, that afternoon and by the next day, uh, we've got a contract on them. Uh, so, and that obviously applies even more so to development opportunities where they're scarcer. And one of the kind of tips I'd throw in there would be to negotiate a special condition to be inserted in the purchase contract so that we can lodge the DA prior to settlement or alternatively negotiate a longer settlement. So lodging the, the DA, which is obviously a bit of a, a dead time because we can't do anything. We can't start on site until we've got that approved, but, um, we, you know, obviously once the settlement of the site occurs, we're going to be start having to start paying for our loan on that. Um, so we want the two to be as close together as we possibly can. So that's just a little tip there. Uh, quickly, just choosing a builder. Um, my preferences around that would be um, looking for smaller uh, family-sized um, builders. Uh, quite often, uh, you know, we look at the builders' websites and uh, marketing material and stuff like that, and they can be uh, not that amazing. And I always say, look, you know, we, 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 I would be hesitant to judge a builder based on their marketing material. We want to know how good they are, and we want to look at, I guess, their history as well. One of my favourite builders in Brisbane, I mean, they've been family-owned business. They've been working in the area for 40 years, father and son team. They're not, they're not getting too big. They do a really great um, your quality of finish, and, and they're very punctual, and they're you know, very reliable. So, you know, it's smaller business like that, that are, and we've got a great relationship and they're the types that you can approach ahead of time, like I was saying, get to visit the site and provide feedback on, on uh, suitability for development. Uh, and also I just encourage to, to shop around. So just to, you know, compare apples with apples because you'd be amazed at what's included, what's not included. Uh, and on that note, we want fixed price contracts. And we want, we want um, builders that are going to cust provide customized designs. Um, Obviously, builders are going to reuse certain designs and things like that, but we want each development to be customised and we want each drawing to be customised, not just cookie cutter. So they're kind of some of the comments there. Very quickly, some huge generalisations in terms of areas um, and looking at this not just from development but also buying established properties. Uh, Brisbane City Council, so this is pretty much my favourite area at the moment for developing, so within the 10k radius of the CBD and Moreton Bay, which we've already touched on. Sydney, there are some certain areas um, that we look at uh, in developing in Sydney. Blacktown Council being a favourite, um, Sutherland Shire, uh, Ringer Shire, a few other areas, but quite frankly, your construction costs are so high um, and the land purchase is so high and also your resale is, you know, the market's going sideways. So again, gross generalisation. Um, so my comment would there would be to, um, based on what I'm seeing, I'd be looking at doing some some purchases where you can reno and hold. So not, again, try and avoid that resale market right now. Uh, so I really do like renovations, love renovations. So anything that we can do uh, value add to property I really like, whether it is as big a scale as development or, or renovations. Uh, and bailout. And look, when I say bailout, I'm saying there's a lot of investors out there at the moment that are, are panicking. They're doing silly things, um, particularly in the investor space because uh, there's fewer investors out there, so there's less competition, so there's some really good buys to be had. Uh, it sounds counterintuitive, but again, that's what we like. Uh, but in Sydney at the moment, we're seeing some really good opportunities. So I'd be, I wouldn't necessarily be jumping on development right now. Right now. Um, Melbourne, um, we've been buying a lot in Melbourne, but quite frankly, I'd be looking at kind of regional Vic myself. Um, and Adelaide and Perth, I'd be looking at established. And Perth uh, is not going to be for everyone, I'm sure. 
Um, you know, Terry's touched on this in, in his reports and so on. But at the same time, it's a fantastic opportunity. It really is a buyer's market. There's some great stuff to be, great buyers to be had there. Um, but again, if you want more info on areas, I very much encourage you to look at um, my colleague Kate Hill's presentation that she did a month or so ago. So I think I've um, used up all our time, but uh, if we have any time, Terry, for any, any questions? Yeah, uh, um, Alex, certainly. Um, we, we do have a little bit of time. Um, if people would like to type their questions into the, the chat box or the Q&A panel, and I'll um, put those to Alex. Um, we have had some come through already, um, Alex. Um, one was just a general question of, um, is there any reason why you focus so much on Brisbane? Is that an area of particular opportunity at the moment, do you think? Um, there's a variety of reasons. I mean, I just like it from an affordability standpoint. So my goal when I was setting up, uh, I guess, the product offering that we, we, we have at Advisable was I really I spent a lot of time and I worked on a variety of different capacities throughout the real estate industry, but I really wanted to bring on board or offer uh, development opportunities that were going to make genuinely make people money, but were as affordable as possible. And that led me to Brisbane because I feel like the the market hasn't boomed in terms of uh, it's had some pretty good solid growth in certain areas. You wouldn't believe it if you're making if you're listening to the the general media, um, but there's been some pockets that have had some significant growth over the last few years. But it's still very affordable. So land prices haven't gone astronomical. I live in the inner west of Sydney myself, and just watching prices go through the roof, it's it's amazing. Um, also in Melbourne, I mean, prices are so expensive. There's still plenty of opportunities in both of those markets. I'm not saying there's, there's opportunities everywhere, but we just like Brisbane from an affordability standpoint. So that's why I kind of targeted that. What's the most affordable area that we can, we can target where construction is also relatively cheap, but most importantly, that resale market is still, still strong. So, um, you know, we've got, we have, we've got a genuine resale market to own occupiers. In this case, based on the examples, it's going to be our second and third home buyers, um, but that's the kind of thing that we, uh, you know, we want to tick all those boxes. So again, I, I was limited; I couldn't show all the examples, but that's that's why we like Brisbane. Uh, yeah. in an Alex, a question about um, you made reference to the stamp duty savings, where you effectively are buying land and developing, so you're not paying a stamp duty on the build. Is it not the case that uh, at least part of the stamp duty savings are negated by the interest bill, the sort of the holding time? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I mentioned that. So, look, it is, it's a bit of a, um, a give and take. Uh, so, you know, your, your holding costs with uh, your progress payments on your construction and things like that are going to eat into the stamp duty savings. So I'm not saying um, that that's, I'm definitely not saying that's a reason why you would uh, you'd buy new. Um, but I'm just pointing out that kind of six one way, half a dozen the other. I mean, you'll still come out ahead based on most calculations that I've done. You'll still come out ahead and the interest is tax deductible. So your progress payments, your interest repayments, if you're going to rent it out at the end, if your intent is to create rental properties, your interest repayments during construction, even though there's no rental income coming in, um, is still tax deductible. So you still come out ahead. But again, you're right. Yep, you've got, definitely got to factor that in. And that's why I mentioned that in the, uh, you know, one of the other slides as well with things to watch out for. Make sure you're going to get into that. A question about a reference you made um, quite early in the presentation where you talked about um, the ability to manufacture yield and the question is, ask, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I guess um, manufacturing yield, what I'm looking at is, um, I mean, you think about the rent return that you get is, is mostly based on, you know, in a roundabout way, it's based on the value of the property itself. So if you're creating equity, you're spending something that was cost you 1.5 into something that's worth 1.7 odd at the end, you're getting a rental yield of 1.7, you know, to the value to coincide with a 1.7 value, but your loan is only 1.5 or funding a 1.5 purchase, if that makes sense. So you're getting a better yield than you would than if you bought um, outright uh, and established. So I guess that's what I look at when I say manufacturing yield. So you're not just manufacturing equity, you're also manufacturing a bit of uh, rent return there as well. Okay. Um, there was also a question, there was a reference you made, Alex, to um, you sort of limited to a maximum of two or three lots. Is that in terms of um, uh, what council allows or is it to do with uh, the finance you can get? That's to do with the, yeah, to do with the latter. So that's really the banks. So with um, funding for development, I mean, it's uh, obviously 
funding right now is is more important than ever. So you're, I always say this. I mean, I always say this. Your your buying capacity at the moment. I mean, it's it's a, an asset in itself right now. It's a commodity in itself. So you really need to use it wisely. But I mean, I was a mortgage broker many years ago. So uh, having having kind of been through that, the best of times. Obviously, it's very different now. I could imagine doing it now, but it is. It's one of the most limiting things, quite frankly, that we we face. Right now, we've got you know dozens and dozens of scores of investors that we're working with that are wanting to buy more properties but just can't access the funding to do it. So it's it's quite interesting. But at the same time, what I mentioned there with the limitations around uh, dwellings is that most banks will look at uh, a maximum subdivision uh, of three dwellings, so turning one lot into three. That's the most they'll fund under standard residential lending. So once you go beyond that, some banks are limited to only two. Uh, and once you go beyond that, uh, that's when it falls under commercial lending. Um, so, and again, that might be fine. You might be able to look at commercial lending. That obviously opens up a total new uh, avenue in terms of the opportunities that you can, you can look at buying. Um, but again, I'm looking at uh, as a starting point with this presentation, it was, okay, let's find development sites that are accessible for, uh, for us mere mortals that are looking at, you know, getting, getting standard residential lending through our, through our um, equity through our existing portfolio or cash deposits and not having, I guess, a track record and being able to prove that we've done this before um, if we don't, haven't had any experience. I think yeah, you mentioned one of your case studies. Um, you had you, to put it uh, in your figures um, to show um, representative figures how the numbers work. A four point five percent interest rate, uh, and that's realistic as long as you fit within those those sort of caps that the, the banks like. Yeah, look, I mean, talk with your broker, but I mean, the, again, this should fit under standard resi lending, so there shouldn't. It's no different than. Um, if you were to buy a house and land package or if you were to do some construction yourself, or, or sorry, buy an established property, funding the construction and a, and a development like this is not going to be any different than, than a standard investment property purchase. Obviously, some of the numbers we're talking about are slightly higher. Um, but again, I'm just painting a brutally honest picture. I don't want to paint a picture of, um, you know, again, the unicorns, things that don't exist or are too good to be true. We say, okay, this is readily achievable. This is what we can find. And there is an established market out there, blocks, and sites like this exist um, and these can be achieved by standard residential lending so your interest rates shouldn't shouldn't be affected um, you know any differently than, than if we're buying an established investment property purchase okay. um, we, we should probably wrap it up shortly Alex but just just one more question perhaps uh, you mentioned uh, towards the end of your presentation the importance of uh, configuring something to sell to owner occupiers, not investors, and what was, what was the reasoning behind that strategy idea? Yeah, look, I think, um, I mean, it kind of ties in with my other you know, rule of thumb that I mentioned, that we want to get the biggest dwelling we can on, on this, that the, the um, block of land will bear. So, you know, and that normally equates to, in this example, if we're doing, if we're limited based on lending to do a subdivision into two lots or maybe three, um, we're not going to be doing townhouses, that's commercial, we're doing um, standard residential, we're going to be doing big homes, okay, so it's, it's, I mean, it's possible that an investor might want to, want to buy one of these big homes if they're a bit more astute and they, they know that they want to hold on to it and sell it to an own occupier down the track, but I mean, it's kind of the same thing where we're looking at appealing to own occupiers. I mean, to me, generally speaking, whether it's established property purchase or not, I always say we want to target own occupiers. They're the ones that are going to make you money when you come, when you come to sell. Uh, and that is because they're willing to pay a premium. Um, again, some investors out there might pay too much for certain things, but again, the, the, we want to buy in a market that's very active with, with owner occupiers. Uh, we won't want to be selling, creating something that we're selling to interstate investors. We want to be saying, selling something where there is a true market in there, people that are thinking emotionally and just like something for what it, what it represents, not necessarily yield and things like that. So again, this is why we're saying with those examples in Wavell Heights, we'll build them, um, uh, you know, build them to suit the local resale market, but we'll leave a bit of space to put in a pool and things like that down the track so we can really maximise our, our capacity to sell to own occupiers come resale. Okay, Alex, well, well, thank you for those responses and for your presentation. I think we should, we've gone a little bit over the hour, so should we, we should probably wrap it up now. And um, by its very nature, um, it's a subject that has um, complexities and there's a lot more for people to know. And I would encourage people 
whose um, appetite has been um, perhaps a little bit whetted or inspired by Alex's presentation to get in touch with Alex or his um, colleague Kate Hill um, via the um, contact details on the screen if you've got further questions or if you're interested in perhaps getting advisable to, to find opportunities for you. Um, please get in touch with them. Um, Alex, thank you for a very informative presentation today. It certainly opened my eyes to some of the possibilities in terms of how you can accelerate, accelerate the, um, the equity creation or wealth creation process by undertaking something a little bit more uh, creative or um, exciting than uh, a passive investment and uh, the, the potential um, is enormous. Um, any final comments from you, Alex, before we wrap it up? No, no, firstly, say thanks to you, Terry. Thanks very much to everyone that's still sticking around. And um, look, any questions at all, um, we don't do the hard sell at Advisable. We're definitely happy to help you. But um, any questions at all, uh, you want a bit of advice, if you move right through a development, you're looking at doing a development, feel free to email me, give me a buzz. I'm happy to, happy to help out. Okay, Alex, thank you again. And thank you everyone for participating. Uh, this is uh, Terry Ryder from Hotspotting uh, signing off. Uh, let's do it again soon, Alex. Um, let's thank find um, the webinars I do with yourself and Kate at Advisable, particularly informative and interesting and certainly gets, uh, gets me inspired to go out and do things. <laughs>